me by name. You conquered the grave. You conquered the grave. You crossed the divide. Lost in our sin. You made us alive. How can we ever hold it inside? We can't hold back. We're going to lift you. We're going to lift you higher, higher. Hearts burning bright like a fire, fire. Voices unite, make it louder, louder. We're never going to stop singing. Oh, we're never going to stop higher, higher. Hearts burning bright like a fire, fire. Voices unite, make it louder, louder. We're never going to stop singing. We're never going to stop singing. We can't hold back what he's done for us. Amen. Every tribe, every tongue, every heart will sing. Every knee we will bow to the risen king. Lift him up, lift him up. We're never going to stop singing. Every tribe, every tongue, every heart will sing. Every knee we will bow to the risen King. Amen. Come on and give him a shout again. Let's sing that one more time. Higher, higher. Hearts burning bright like a fire, fire. Voices unite, make it louder, louder. We're never gonna stop singing. Who we're never gonna stop singing. Hey Amen. We will never stop singing. God, you are worthy of all praise. You are so worthy. Jesus, I pray right now for anyone who's carrying a heavy burden today. God, I just pray that in this very moment, they will lay it at your feet. Jesus, we just want to walk with you today. We just want to walk with you in your garden. God, the way that you walked with Adam in the cool of the day. Jesus, walk with us today. Let us know you more today. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear
flowers I'd stay in the garden with him though the night around me be falling he bids me go through the voice of woe his voice to me his call And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever Amen. stars they wept the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was fallen his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon him
sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb has overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb has overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. today that he lives because he lives we can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone how many have had a little fear here and there in the last couple of months <laughs> year <laughs> maybe but because he lives that fear is gone and we can just focus on Jesus today. Amen. At this time, we're going to open up our communion. If you would like to partake in communion, it's on the sides. We'll have someone there to help you. Oh, never mind. It's corporate communion, so I have to hand it over to the big guy. <laughs> oh, there you go. Check, check. Here we are. All right. As Elena was saying, today is corporate communion. So what we're going to do is we have the elders off to the side. If you would come on the outsides here, grab the elements. Um, hold on to them as you get back to your seat, and then we will take them together. Um, you are welcome to come up and do so at this time. I would like to add that you do not need to be a member of the church as long as you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. So let's come up at this time and grab our elements.
Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we read this, beginning in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread this morning. In the same way, after supper, he also took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant established by my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink from the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's partake of the cup this morning. It is time for Surge Kids, for anybody who wants to head back with me to party and have a little fun. Meet me out in the foyer. <laughs> you guys are partying. <laughs> Amen. All right. Before we get um, too far into things here, before I get too far ahead of myself, um, we have a special guest with us this morning that would like to 
come up and say a word. So Joel DeBooth, why don't you come on up here? Let's welcome him up this morning. Lighthouse are thankful for the blood of Jesus. Amen. So I'm here to share real briefly with you. Those of you, many of you know, Sunday nights are a, a madhouse in this building, okay? That's because you have openly offered your facilities to host the North Nahaska FC program. We want to say thank you for that. The Joseph Project Research, I'm sorry, the Joshua Project Research tells us the least evangelized people groups in the world are the Laos people, the Afghanistan people, parts of Morocco. We can't all go to these places. Perhaps the least discipled place in the world is right here in America because we don't have the time to develop our understanding of truth, okay? We don't make the time in America. It's a problem. Matthew 28, 19, we all know it well, says Jesus, his last words to his people was what? Go out into all the earth and make what? You make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them. Fellowship of Christian Athletes, also known as FCA, is a program that is purely designed to multiply. It is the motto of making disciples who make disciples, who make disciples who make disciples. It's exponential. When done well and done right, it works, but it requires commitment and time. The North Mask FC program began at the beginning of this last school year, 2020, in the middle of what we consider to be one of the worst years we've seen in a while. However, God has blessed us and shown us favor He's given us facilities with a people and leadership who understand we have one common goal, that is to make disciples. So that's what we are about. There are two individuals sitting here that we absolutely could not do this without. You all know Ron and Kathy Thompson really well. We've gotten to know them even better over this cor the courses last year. There are no other Ron and Kathys ever anywhere in the world. So we have a huge thank you to them. We have a huge thank you to you to your church. We meet every Sunday night here. If you want to see the crazy zoo of a place this becomes, you're welcome to stop by and check it out. We meet at 6 o'clock every Sunday night. We also meet on Monday mornings, bi-weekly, on campus, where we do large group Bible studies. We also meet to disciple and mentor student leaders every Friday morning. We have a school and administration up the road that understands the principles of godly living. And so they've opened the school up for us. COVID hasn't stopped us. COVID hasn't slowed us down at all. We've ministered directly to well over 100 kids throughout the course of the school year. Not all at the same time, but we, we have touched lives and we believe it is effective. So since we are all about multiplying, um, that is our mission. I'm simply here to say thank you. Uh, we have a couple extra leaders. Of course, my wife Nicole is here with me. Brett and Acacia Morris have been instrumental in developing this program with us. Ron and Kathy are here. Many of you know John and Tammy Gumont. They are strong leaders of the program. Uh, Levi Nunnikoven. So we have great, great leaders in place. And so on behalf of all of us, we want to say thank you. And of course, we don't have, we're not a youth group. We don't have a church budget. We don't have an operational expense account that we use to generate funds, okay? We do rely on faithful giving of the community, and we have been blessed by the community. Um, if you choose to give to North Mask FCA, it's very simple. You put in your memo, NM FCA. So, of course, it's tax deductible. Um, that's just, if you want to give, that's how you give. So, thank you, thank you, thank you. I believe lives are being transformed as a result of both our faithful serving and your faithful generosity. So on behalf of North Alaska FCA, thank you. All right. I should mention.
prayer. If you can't give, you can always pray. My wife was trying to do something back there. I don't know. I just now caught on. She's saying we need prayer. We do need prayer. Okay? So please pray. might hear me if I actually turn my mic on. Helps, don't it? Yes. All right. Okay, a couple quick announcements here, um, and then we'll get into the, the message portion. Again, FCA folks, happy to have you. Thanks for, for coming up. We're happy to be a part of what God's doing. Um, men, gentlemen, fellas, whatever you prefer, ISI deadline is March 12th for signing up for the group um, discount here. We're thinking we're going to hit that target. Um, so if you want to come with us, we're traveling over to Davenport Coram Deo Church and um, been in touch with, uh, with Roy. He said that we got plenty of seating, but knowing guys, we kind of tend to do things at the last minute. So it's probably going to fill up here really fast as we get close to um, that April uh, time to come. So um, there's a sign-up sheet out in the foyer. Uh, foyer. I knew I was going to need this. Um, or you can email the church. Either way, we'll, uh, we'll get you signed up here. All right? Good Time Fellowship is meeting immediately after service. We have a blast. We have food. We have fun. So uh, be sure to, uh, to come out and visit. All right? Let's go ahead and I'm going to open us up here in a word of prayer. And we'll get into the message. All right? Father God, thank you so much. So, so much, God. Just so in awe of everything that you've done, God, and around us, Lord, and within our own hearts, Lord, your spirit is moving, Lord, and we just we praise your name, God, and we just lift you up in this place. Be magnified in our words, God, in our worship. What an excellent, awesome time, and God, I just pray that you would um, give us ears to hear and hearts to, um, to be receptive to your word this morning. In Jesus' mighty, mighty name, amen. All right. There. I found a new, uh, few newspaper headlines the other day that I thought were pretty interesting. The first one, state population to double by 2040, babies to blame. <laughs> They'll do that. The second one here, China may be using the sea to hide submarines. Imagine that. <laughs> City of South Haven still unsure why the sewer smells. <laughs> I may have an idea. Last one, and yes, this was intentional. Stolen prosthetic arm discovered at secondhand shop. Oh, what are we going to do with this guy? All right, none of that has anything to do with this morning's message. I just found them hilarious. When I was thinking about this message series, what we're kind of into, the, the, the theme that was on my heart, um, the main tug, I guess, was as we had mentioned last week, there is a need, a calling to move deeper into the things of God in our lives, beyond the norm, beyond what we're accustomed to. And the best way I could think of this is that there's, there's just simply so many Christians today that are satisfied with only eating the pie crust and not the actual pie. We're all right with the surface level, but there's so much more in there that God has in store for us, that God wants to see in us and through us, that I worry we just don't get to sometimes. Revival is on my mind. It's on the minds of others. We talked about it last week. We want that. We've got to have more of God. Amen? So with that being said, there's a couple things that I want to talk about, some uh, subjects that 
you might not always hear about. At least they're not as commonplace topic-wise in the church as, um, as maybe some other uh, subjects. And I think sometimes that we're too scared to approach those ideas. They get kind of intimidating. Last week we talked about miracles. Um, some people just unsure maybe with the general idea. Some people just like, do, even, do miracles even occur today? I mentioned last week I'm a firm believer that they do. Um, but there's just a few things on my mind that I feel like we're, we're being led to, um, to kind of keep our mind on and operate with a kind of a spirit of expectancy and a, an eye on the lookout for what God is going to be doing. Um, some of the takeaways, of course, for last week were that we need to understand the miraculous as a reality and that we have a spiritual assignment to operate with an expectancy for miracles. That should both be encouraging and challenging all at the same time. And granted, we expect these things and we're praying in accord with the purposes of the kingdom of heaven, right? Not accord, in accord with our own desires. It's not about us. We are, um, we are you know, vessels that God's spirit can move through for the purpose of building his kingdom. Um, and think back to the examples that I gave, and I think they illustrated that perfectly well. The prayer that we had that one time for my arm to be restored, for that miracle to take place, that didn't happen. And I had a direct word from the Lord saying, no, it's not about just simply making stuff happen for the sake of making stuff happen. I can use you more as you are than I could if a miracle would take place there, right? But in the same boat, that friend of mine who witnessed a disfigured foot grow back right before her very eyes, grow and set into place. That happened because that instance was for, king, for the kingdom. I didn't know everything that happened as a result of that. I can imagine if something like that were to happen, quite the testimony, right? Hey, you knew I used to, I'm sure they had some sort of, uh, maybe they had crutches or some sort of special um, footwear that they had to use and to walk around and to not have that anymore. Something was being used through that purpose, right? So miracles absolutely take place today. We should operate with an expectancy for those. Today, I want to talk about the importance of operating with a prophetic aspect to our faith. No, I'm not saying we run around and then call ourselves prophets. That's different. Um, dress up in robes and call your, giving yourself a, a glorious Abraham or Moses style beard. You can grow one out if you want, join the club. Um, I mean, we don't run around with signs saying the end is near or something. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. But there is a very real element to our faith, to what we believe and to what God has for us that incorporates that. It incorporates the prophetic. It incorporates a spirit-sensitive element to the heart of God. I think it's an unfortunate fact that too much of the American church, um, this element has been so misunderstood and it's been so abused um, that... uh, Again, we're too afraid to talk about it. We, we use that word, and it's almost like a, a Christian swear word. We don't, we don't use that in polite context. It's my hope this morning that we can clear things up a bit and that we can see that not only is this a very real part of what we believe, it's a very real part of God's Spirit moving in his people. If we want that revival again, we've got to let the Spirit flow. We've got to be willing to be used But it's my hope then that we can see the importance of having that in our faith. Just like with miracles, there's a willingness and a need, I guess, for that willingness to step out and be that prophetic voice at times. To begin, I'm going to take us to Acts chapter 2. And you may already know where I am getting at here. This is a landmark passage, pretty amazing part of Scripture. Um, it's one of the most interesting ones because Pentecost has come. You've got the Holy Spirit descending in a truly marvelous way. Things are happening. Things are moving. And there are people who are gathered. They're speaking in tongues. God is changing the atmosphere. He's setting a course that would forever alter human history. 
An interesting situation. Around them, in that upper room, everything was being so radically changed that the public's response to everything going on here to these, uh, to these guys was, holy moly, they must be intoxicated. It was so different from what they were used to, not what, what they were expecting to maybe come out of this situation. Those guys have had a little bit too much wine. That part's pretty comical. But what I find truly interesting is Peter's response in turn to the crowds. He doesn't say, no, we, that's not what's going on here, and then just kind of leave it at that. He's got a whole sermon here that he uh, delivers. No, there's no empty wine bottles laying around. What is happening now is the fulfillment of God's promise for what was to come. And we'll see this here, a snippet of it. And Acts 2, 16 through 18. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my male and female slaves in those days, and they will prophesy. All right. There's no room for maybes. There's no one specific age group that's excluded. There is something moving in the spirit that in turn affects all of God's people. This is an interesting time. This is an interesting moment. Despite what some have have said, I'm not of the mindset that this is just limited to the day of the Lord, meaning the specific points in which Jesus returns. Verse 20 tells us all of this happens before that. All right? So there's more I could say on that note, more I could elaborate on. This isn't a teaching session, though. I've got to kind of get going here for the sake of time. Just know this. If the church is going to be the body of Christ... If the church is going to be the body of Christ, it needs to expect his voice to at times speak through that body. We need to be ready, sensitive, and willing to let the Lord use us to overturn principalities of darkness, overthrow demonic strongholds, and declare the providence and the purposes of God to a dying generation so desperately in need of his salvation and his truth. The time for a complacent, laid-back, lax American church is over. It's over. Our nation is in enough turmoil. It cannot afford for the church, its salvation messenger, to hold back any longer. We have a spiritual war to win. Amen? Amen? So the big takeaway here for us this morning, there's a difference, something I want us to see because I think it's, it's so important in getting past those, that confusion around this, this term, is that there is a difference between calling yourself a, a prophet and then operating at times under the direction and the influence of the Holy Spirit with a word that comes from him through you and to someone else. Or also, what can happen is God begins to reveal things to your spirit, and you serve as sort of a spiritual barometer for things going on around you. You see things maybe people aren't going to be able to see at times. So I hope we can see a little bit of a difference here. Um, Having that guidance and that knowledge from the spirit there, it's different. We're all called to operate in the prophetic, but we're not all called to run around calling ourselves prophets. Big difference, all right? We're going to go to Numbers chapter 11. This is going to be kind of the primary text, I guess. I'm going to, of course, bounce around a little bit more. But Numbers chapter 11, and we're going to look at verses 24 through 26. So if you're flipping there, oh, I'm flipping there myself, so I'll give you a second. All right. 
And of course, we got it on the screen. Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, beginning here in verse 24. He brought 70 men from the elders of the people and had them stand around the tent. All right, the tabernacle, essentially where the presence of God was supposed to reside, okay? That's where he was invited to come. Then the Lord descended in, a, in the cloud and spoke to them. He took some of the spirit that was on Moses and placed that spirit on the 70 elders. As the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they never did it again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other Medad, and I'm sure your dad and my dad were there too, right? Okay, it's awful. Some of these Old Testament names, I just, they get to me. I couldn't resist. All right. The spirit rested on them. These two, okay. These two remained in the camp, one Eldad and the other Medad. The spirit rested on them. They were among those listed, but not, had not gone out to the tent. And they prophesied in the camp. All right. Let's pause here for a moment. I find what's going on here to be pretty fascinating, to be quite honest with you. What it shows is just how powerful the influence and the breakthrough of the Spirit is when things take place in a body of believers. It is very interesting to me. There's a mighty release of God's Spirit, a prophetic anointing that while manifest in the lives of those around the tents, gets delivered to these other two fellows simply because they were all in fellowship together. Breakthrough for some, in other words, meant breakthrough for all. I mean, look, you got 70 people gathered around the tabernacle, the house of the Lord. Two people, for some reason, didn't quite get the note. They, I assume, were arguing about why their names were so similar or something. But my point here is that the manifest presence of God and the blessing of seeing his spirit move made its way to them because of the outpouring of the spirit initially through the 70, because they were seeking and they were earnestly going after him. There's something to the reality of being in a covenantal bond in the body of Christ that when breakthrough happens and the Spirit of the Lord moves in one part, it in turn influences and it filters out into the rest of the body. Hmm. All it takes, all it takes to start a forest fire is a spark. I don't know how many of us have had experiences similar to this before, but I've had situations just like that myself where I felt led to just stop what I was doing and just start praying. I didn't know what, who, I didn't know the details, I didn't know what all about. I even had one of these instances this past week. Um, I don't necessarily know about, again, at the time, but come to find out later on, a friend of mine or a family member or somebody was really struggling, they were having a hard time, they were, they were just being attacked, there was something going on there that they were just really struggling and in need of breakthrough in that situation. I didn't know. I didn't, they didn't call me, send me a text message or anything like that, but I just felt that I needed to just stop what I was doing and just start praying. In those moments, that prayer of mine became prophetic. It wasn't simply submitting a request to heaven and hoping for the best to come about. Lord, if you hear me, maybe, you know, this and that. No, my prayer came into agreement with a desire from the heart of the Father. A spiritual battle was fought, and the Lord took home the victory. The Holy Spirit will, at times, if you let him, he will impress on your heart to step into prayer for things that you yourself may not have all the details about. But by being in fellowship, being in a bond, by praying, and by, by being that willing vessel, God uses you to minister to their situation without you having to have any knowledge of the situation. We serve a pretty amazing God. I'll give you... One specific example here that happened to me personally, 
Um, just because still thinking about this gives me shivers. It was just so, oh, the way that it happened. I was at a church service back in the Quad Cities when we still lived there. And uh, I was going through a particularly difficult time. I'll be honest with you. It was not, not an easy moment. I had a lot going through my mind. I had a lot of big decisions that I needed to make that were going to change the way my life looked. And I was, I'll be honest with you, I was really stressed and really just anxious and everything. My, my spirit was just down about it. I was, I was having a hard time. The spirit of the Lord was so tangible in that service that morning. We had a time of prayer afterward, and I found myself up at the altar, and I was, I was praying about the situation that I was facing, okay? Keep in mind, I hadn't told a single soul about anything that was going on, okay? I was just there. I hadn't told anybody. Nobody knew the details. A friend of mine came up to me there, and while I was praying, he laid hands on me, and he said, Eric, I don't know what's going on, but the Lord spoke to me, and he said that you're, you're asking about something right now. You're asking about something right now, and he wants you to know that you just need to step out in faith. You need to just go through with it and press onward. Leave the details to him. When you have big shifts in your faith and, 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 and your life, and when things are changing like that, it can be kind of scary. And that, that word right there was so timely, and it gave me that reassurance. It was so... It was so comforting, but at the same time, I'm telling you the truth. Hair stood up on the back of my neck. I got goosebumps the whole nine yards. It was, um, it was an experience, I'll tell you that. God will at times use the anointing of his, his presence to speak a word through us and into the lives of others around us. We simply got to be willing. Continuing in chapter 11 here, verses 27 through 29. A young man ran and reported to Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant to Moses, since his youth, responded, Moses, my lord, stop them. <laughs> I can't help but laugh that these two are tattling to Moses about something that the Lord is doing in the lives of others. But Moses asked him, are you jealous on my account? If only all the Lord's people were prophets and the Lord would place his spirit on them. Interesting. Are you jealous on my account? Moses says, what makes you think that all of this happening is mine? What makes you think all of this happening is about me? God will have his kingdom brought to earth. He will use the gifts of the Spirit, laying hands on people. He'll use miracles like we talked about last week. Now we're talking about prophetic words and prayer. God will use all of this. And yes, the details, the who, what, where, when can change, but it all accomplishes his will for his glory. We get to be part of the play, but we don't get to take center stage. That's his role. If only all the Lord's people were prophets and the Lord would place his spirit on them, many times in the Old Testament, if not most of the time, that the public saw that the spirit was with someone and recognized it in its fullness, this occurred because the prophetic word of the Lord was coming forth from them. Now granted, most of the times in the Old Testament, those words weren't exactly good. They weren't exactly happy. Hey, listen, you got to turn around. This nation's in trouble. Judgment is coming. Something's got to change here, or things are not going to be looking very good, and you're not going to enjoy it. Regardless, the fact of the matter remained is that, is that these individuals were recognized as distinct prophets of God because his word was being confirmed in those who were speaking to they were speaking to, and it was bearing fruits. So big takeaway here. A major sign that the fullness of the Spirit of the Lord dwelled with someone was prophecy. 
This is probably why when you get to 1 Corinthians, you see Paul placing, you know, he's talking about the gifts of the Spirit. You see him placing such a huge emphasis on prophecy. 1 Corinthians 14, beginning here, verse 1. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, and above all, that you may prophesy. Skip down to verses 3 through 4. But the person who prophesies speaks to people for edification, encouragement, and consolation. The person who speaks in another tongue or language, tongues, builds himself up. But he who prophesies builds up the church. All right. Here's another way to read that. If your tongue edifies yourself, if tongues edifies you, prophecy edifies the body of Christ. I hope we're getting a better picture of it, better feeling of what that word means. It's a little bit less about tinfoil hats and a little bit more about the manifest outpouring of God's spirit on his people. And in all honesty and full transparency, I am definitely aware, depending on your upbringing, where you've been in your faith and so on, your family, um, a lot of factors, prophecy can carry all sorts of negative connotations. It can mean a lot. It can mean weird things to people sometimes. We can get a really confused picture that doesn't line up with what we've been talking about. I'll be honest, when I rededicated my life to the Lord, uh, <laughs> during my first few years of study, I didn't quite know how to understand all of this. This aspect to our faith. I'd, I would get to this, um, this kind of passage here, I, I would see that, and I would just flip on past it. Not quite sure what to think about all that. So for clarity here, operating, though, in the prophetic is more of a lifestyle. It is a mindset. It is a way that we communicate to others. It is an understanding that when we pray, it is not meant to be a one-way street. We're not just simply sending words to heaven, right? Like we talked about earlier. We're not just simply saying, Lord, here's um, kind of like a, you know, a feedback card. You go to a restaurant and they have those set up sometimes. How was your stay? Well, here you go. And then chances are you never hear back from it. No, that's not what this is about. Prayer is not meant to be a one-way street. It is speaking a timely word. The prophetic prayer is speaking a timely word from the Lord to someone who so desperately needs to hear that and get that word in their spirit. When that happens, it bears fruit, it edifies and encourages that person, and you're inter- the person that you're interacting with, and they in turn give God the glory, all right? The church gets edified, the body grows. So prophecy doesn't need to be saddled with all sorts of, of weird stuff. You can use your imagination, but we need this church. We need the spirit to move in us. We need to be open and willing to be his voice to people that need to hear it. We need to understand that our mission, our calling, we need to understand the power and the purpose of a proper prophetic word in a timely manner. We live in a day and an age where the media has almost absolute control over who hears what. Christian voices are being silenced for speaking up about their faith, and we're being told what to believe about things that violate the very word of God. Enough is enough. We have got to step up. It's time to step up and step out. We need to be the voice in the wilderness crying out, prepare the way of the Lord. I need to stop. Lord of the Rings, you shall not pass. There's the line, Eric. We need that prophetic voice, church. The world needs to hear his voice and let his voice drown out the lies of hell. Amen. Let's move on before I need blood pressure medication. (laughs) Two more quick passages here. The first one, Isaiah 59, 21. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you, my words that I have put in your mouth, will not depart from your mouth or from the mouth of your children or from the mouth of your children's children from now on and forever, says the Lord. There's no limit here. There's no end. 
But in case you're wondering, well, you know, isn't that directed, this is Isaiah, isn't this directed at the nation of Israel, the people then? Our next passage answers that worry. Acts 3, 24 through 25. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days, and you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your blessing, through your offspring, the peoples of the earth will be blessed. This is clearly the New Testament church, right? You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant. Which covenant? We're hearkening back here to what gets bundled up here. Isaiah 59, 21. This is my covenant, my promise, my bond with you, my spirit that is on you, my words in your mouth, and none of this shall depart from you or your children. Just like what Paul said, we earnestly seek after that voice, that prophetic word, because it's recognized that in those instances, in that fullness, that the fullness of the Spirit of God was there and was in that word, in that moment. Amen? They're having fun. All right, I'm going to skip ahead here. So, um, Delena. I don't think she can hear me. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Joel. If you get the, uh, the, the gist of this message here is this. If you get anything from today, let it be this. The willingness to be that prophetic voice in the lives of others. It is part of who we are. It's part of our identity. It's part of what we do. It's part of our divine assignment because of that covenantal promise that God has taken and transferred to his people. We are on a mission to carry out the spirit of the Lord and the word of the Lord, because they are one and the same. If Jesus is the word made flesh and we carry his presence, then guess what? We also carry his voice and his word. Do we want that revival? Amen? Do we want it? Mm, amen. Do we want to be his hands and feet? My prayer for this, us this morning then is that we ask God to give us ears to hear him. That our spirits are sensitive to him, to the, his leading. And when we ask God to give us divine encounters and opportunities to let his voice flow through us, speaking his word and his life into people around us, we need this church. People get ready people get ready. Let me close in prayer here. Father, when you move, I pray that we move. When you speak, I pray that we speak. When you see somebody who needs a touch from you, I pray that we are the hand that touches them. God, help us this morning to be led by your spirit, God, and to to be looking out for those opportunities. I don't believe you operate on the basis of coincidence. You bring people into our lives in moments that are critical there. And I pray that we would be receptive to that and we would say, yeah, that's that's the one. That's the person that I I had a dream about. I'm supposed to speak this to them. I'm I'm supposed to to get to know this person because they may not look it on the outside, Lord, but they're, they're dying and they're hurting on the inside. Lord, let your spirit come. Keep us all safe, healthy. Go with us as we go from this building this morning. The church goes on a mission when it leaves its walls. In Jesus' mighty, mighty name, amen.